Thank you for tuning into Literary Blend, a publishing podcast. I'm your host, Demi Michelle Schwartz. There's no perfect recipe for chasing a dream in the publishing industry, but I hope the conversations on this show give you the ingredients you need to bake yours into reality. So let's flip the page and get into this chapter of Literary Blend. Hello, friends. Welcome back to Literary Blend. Today's chapter is called Mental Health and Publishing. And joining me on the show for a conversation about this important topic is Caroline J. Trussell. Hi, Caroline. Hi, how's it going? Fantastic. How's it going for you? Great. I'm happy to be on. Yeah, absolutely. I'm delighted to have you. And I'm so excited to dive into this chat. But first, can you please share with everyone a little about yourself and your journey in publishing so far? Awesome, of course. Um, So my journey into publishing is a little bit, I guess I would say, Um, non-traditional. So I graduated from college, and then I wasn't exactly sure, like, what I wanted to do. I knew I wanted to do something that had to do with writing and editing. So I was in journalism for a little bit, and then I was a technical editor, and I did some consulting with like the government lol (laughs) and I still do that as my full-time job but I just I kind of like had a revelation I guess I would say in 2019 that I was like what involves like working with books and editing and like being able to read all the time and I was like oh publishing why did I never think of that until now um so then I fully like just really went into trying to find like either a job as an editorial assistant or like a assistant at a literary agency. Um, I did a lot of research because I feel like there's kind of a, kind of a curtain there with some of the information like around literary agencies. Like it's super mysterious, I think sometimes. Um, But I honestly, I cold emailed like a bunch of agencies and I was like, can I please be your intern? Um, And I was able to get an internship with the Jennifer DiChiara literary agency. Um, so that's kind of where my, I would say, career, I guess, in being or like in like the agency side started. Um, so I did that for about nine months. And then I actually did the Columbia publishing course in 2021, which was super helpful. Um, I feel like it helped just kind of solidify that I wanted to be a literary agent. Um, as much as I loved hearing about like being an editorial assistant and being like, on the editorial side at a publishing house. Um, I felt like I really liked the idea of having like a career long um, partnership with authors. Um, So then I started after like I did the course, I, um, I was a reader for the Bent agency. Um, So I like read and evaluated manuscripts kind of on an as needed basis. Um, And then finally landed an internship with my current agency, which is Metamorphosis Literary Agency. And I've been with them since like mid beginning of 2022. I should know the exact date, but I don't. (laughs) Um, I want to say it was like May, I think. So I think I've been with them actually exactly two years now. Um, And I became an agent in December, 2022. So that was a very long story, but It is a long journey, but if you're passionate about it, it's definitely worth it. I love that so much. And I totally relate to the whole thing of the mystery behind a lot of things in publishing. I feel like until you actually start doing something in publishing and meeting people, it's really hard to know everything that goes on behind the scenes. And it's been really eye-opening for me over the past couple of years, learning things and just have to say... Because butterflies are a huge part of my brand, Metamorphosis is like the coolest name for literary agencies. You guys win. <laughs> Thank you. I, yeah, I saw that. I was like, oh, she really likes butterflies. I like, <laughs> yeah, I, I love the name too. It's like, I don't know. I can't remember what the philosophy is. Like, I know Stephanie, the CEO, probably has like a philosophy for why the name is. I guess, tra- I guess we help transform our authors into the best they can be. Yeah. They can metamorphosize. Yeah, so <laughs> or metamorphose, whatever the word is. <laughs> well, wonderful journey for you so far. So congrats on all of that. And now let's shift into our chat. So to kick us off, what are some general thoughts you have about mental health and the publishing industry? I love talking about this. Um, if anyone follows me on Twitter, they know that it's something I talk about quite a lot, maybe too often. 
Um, I feel like as far as like mental health, as, as it connects to like publishing, um, publishing can be a very like hard industry to be in. Um, it's very subjective as every, anyone who's ever queried knows that. Um, that's what a lot of agents say, you know, when they, when you get a response from them. Um, and I think as far as like mental health and publishing, like it's just very important as, you know, a writer or an agent or whatever, like role you play in publishing to understand like you're dealing with like another human being and to just be like as kind as you can. Um, especially when it's like something that someone has kind of put their whole heart into, like, which is, you know, when someone writes a story, it's not just like, oh, I'm just going to like write this random thing. Well, I mean, maybe it is, but it's still like they put like their heart and soul into it. So I think it's really important for like authors to support each other, for agents to support each other, especially now. Um, there just seems to be kind of a lot of like discord. Um, not really sure why. I mean, I, I have some ideas as to why, but like, I think, <laughs> I think we might talk about that later. So I'll, I'll do it. Um, but I don't know. I think, yeah, I don't know if um, that kind of answers like the question, but if it's more like around, you know, being on submission, like being able to like, just do self care and like, just give yourself grace because whether you're like someone who has an agent who's on submission or someone who is an author who's trying to get an agent, or even if you're just doing like independent publishing, self-publishing, like it's hard out there. There's people who are going to think your writing is the greatest thing ever. And there's people who are going to think it's, I hope they wouldn't say it's the worst thing ever, but they might not quite be their taste. So it's like just giving yourself grace and understanding like, you should be prioritizing your mental health, like no matter like what it is. Yeah, no, so many great points. And we're going to expand on several of those during our chat. But I think it's really important to, again, recognize that it is hard and it's hard for everyone. I think I've seen so much on Twitter of, you know, just people not recognizing that people who are agents and editors, publishers, they are human too. And we as authors can feel the pain with the rejection. But I've seen so many agents tweet like sending rejections is their least favorite part because they know it hurts. And as agents too, like you guys face rejections too, if you offer on a project and the author signs with somebody else. So everyone's facing the rejection and it's really difficult. And for me personally, with the social media side of things, I try to separate myself from it. And for a while, I would just go down these rabbit holes and scroll, 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 and it would really mess with my head. And when things online mess with my head, it messes with my creativity and it's hard for me to focus on writing which isn't a good thing and so I've made it a total point for myself to completely separate myself from social media whenever things are toxic on there because things are hard enough as authors dealing with being on submission querying whatever and we don't need the added stress of drama on top of that and so the social media definitely plays a big role and I've tried to separate myself from that and to your point too about the subjectivity that's always hard because I remember when I was querying, I went through so many edits. I got so much feedback on my book, my third one before I started querying. I really took my time with it. And when I was getting the rejections, it started to mess with my head and make me think, God, like, what is wrong with me? Am I this bad? And it really starts to make you doubt yourself, which is not fun either. So it's definitely a challenge. Yeah, I completely agree with you. Like, I have, I've been at points where I've had to just, I've turned my notifications off for like Twitter and TikTok and things like that. Like I do go on both of them regularly, but I literally will be on there for like five minutes and I'll immediately get off and like, I'll, you know, I'll have my, my accounts that I follow that I know they're like pretty positive or like just supportive and stuff. And then I'll just get off because I was going down the same rabbit hole. Um, cause I'm, I'm also like an author I write as well. And I actually am querying right now, um, which people, some people don't know, some people do. So I totally relate to the whole rejection thing. And like, I have gone through like imposter syndrome too on that side. Um, and it is just, it's very subjective and it's, it's hard because I feel like you start to kind of compare yourself to people too. Um, and that's like not what it should be about. It should be about like 
you know, building each other up. And it's hard because social media, it's like you only see kind of the good side of what's going on for people, which is good, but like, it's not like an accurate portrayal. So then you're like kind of comparing yourself to something that might not be realistic. And then, you know, it it can affect your mental health. So yeah, lots of great points. And going back to the social media thing of positivity, I do timeline cleanses from time to time and just unfollow people that are being toxic because I don't need that in my space. And so we have control over our spaces to remove toxicity is that a word <laughs> is that a word yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> I was like pausing I was like oh wait yeah but remove that from our spaces and also with the support system for me like my friends both authors and agents and just people who have nothing to do with publishing they genuinely have kept me going this entire time because when you have especially friends in the industry who know what it's like you're in the same boat they get it and then the ones outside too they can be there for you as well and I could not have gotten through every everything if I didn't have my support system and people to lean on and so I think that helps mental health some too if you have people to talk things out because it's never healthy to bottle things up and it's also not a good idea to post things on the timeline publicly that can hurt your reputation so having people you can trust and talk to privately to get things out of your system can be really good. Yeah, I definitely think that's really important to have like a good support system and just remembering that like, not to sound like I am, (laughs) not to sound like I'm like an old grandma being like, you shouldn't post this on social media. But like, just remember, like, if you are a querying author, like, signing with an agent is basically like, having a job almost like, it's, it's more like having a partnership. But like, agents do look at people's Uh, social medias and they see like what you post so if you're posting very negative content like knocking people down it's going to make someone not want to work with you as much because why would you want to work with someone that's that has to put other people down to feel better I guess yeah that's a really good point and this just brings back to the point of that yes we love books and we love the art of it but it's a business and you just need to be professional too So tying back to the rejection for a bit, it is difficult, as we mentioned, but what are your tips for coping with rejection? Oh, oh boy. (laughs) I'm like, I I feel like I have good tips for other people, but I am not the best at dealing with it myself. So it's kind of funny. Um, I would just say, like, kind of what I, I guess I talked about earlier is making sure to like do whatever you feel like is best for your mental health. Like if you have been querying for months and you feel like you really haven't gotten that much feedback or it's just kind of been like rejection after rejection or, you know, people are, are, might be giving like some feedback, but it's not really like something you can incorporate easily and you feel like it's just affecting you so much. I say like, take a break, like take a break go on a vacation, like do, do what you need to do, like for your mental health. Like I don't think like in two or three months, if you decide to pick it back up again, like it's really going to be like, oh my gosh, the genre I was working on is no longer a thing. Like, yes, there's publishing trends that come and go, but I wouldn't say that, that they come and go that quickly. Um, and then as far as like, just, yeah. So self-care is like, I would say the number one tip I have. And then I would say kind of going back to what we were talking about with like the support system, like really utilizing your support system that you have, whether it's like friends outside of like publishing that may not be authors, they might not know anything about like, you know, querying or things like that. Or if it's fellow authors that are in the same boat that, that are really familiar with what you're going through. Um, I think that makes a world of difference. Just like having people you can talk to and like, um, just kind of like, I wouldn't say vent, but just, you know, like share, share what you're going through with. I know it's really hard when you get like a number of rejections, but really remembering like why you're a writer, like why you enjoy writing and the fact that it's because you have a story to tell and you have to tell it. Um, and I think trying to like, just focus on, not just focus on it, but try to focus on that at least partly, Um, I even have like in my rejection that I send out to people, like, you know, like I hate form rejections, but sometimes they're necessary. 
Um, I even have like in my form rejection, like, please like, don't forget like why you love writing and continue to like hone your craft and remember like why you're a writer or something along those lines, because I don't want people to get so discouraged that they're like, I'm just, I don't want to be a writer anymore. Like if you're a writer, you're a writer for a reason. And it's because you have a story to tell. So I just don't want people to forget that. Yeah, so much great advice there. And I think it's really important to return to the root of what you're doing and why you're doing it and discovering that love again, if you feel like you've lost it. And you made so many great points. But just two that I wanted to add. First, a big thing for me when I was querying was celebrating the small wins. Like if I got a personalized rejection, that was huge for me because like you said, form rejections are necessary and knowing the amount of queries that agents are getting now, it'd be humanly impossible for everybody to get personalized feedback. So whenever I got personalized feedback that was encouraging or maybe even a rejection with actionable feedback that I was able to apply, I saw that as a small win because that agent took extra time for me. And the second thing I will say is that I always was working on something else while I was Korean because I think number one it I feel like it helped me get an agent quicker because my third book got me an agent but I was only querying for a year and four months because I was always writing and working on the next thing but more than that it helped me stay connected to the craft that book that I was writing while I was querying didn't have all the pressure of oh my gosh like do I need to make all these changes in the opening pages is a query letter bad all that stuff when I was writing it I was in a new story I was enjoying it was a work in progress I was having fun with it I was reconnecting with my love for writing and that really kept me going and now being on submission I'm doing the exact same thing and so I think it's really important to always have another project going if you can because it helps to remind you why you love to write yeah I completely agree especially like being on submission like my current authors I always tell them like just keep working on the next thing like even if you have like a small idea like just go with it and start writing because being on submission is a very 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 long very long journey. So, and I I know querying is as well, but yeah. So just, yeah, working on the next thing I would definitely say, and that's kind of what I'm doing as well right now too, as I'm like in the querying journey, because a lot of the time I don't think people's like, or maybe, maybe for some people, but from a lot of people that I've talked to, it's not like their first book that they query that they get an agent with. Most of the time it's like their second or third book. So Yeah, no, for sure. And I think that's, like you said, you know, just, or like we both said, just to keep going and keep writing and keep writing that next thing. Because as authors, that's the goal to write for the rest of our lives. So don't stop just because you're in the trenches. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So now let's shift gears and chat more specifically on mental health representation in publishing when it comes to the books and authentic representation and things like that. So what are your thoughts on this? Oh, I have a lot of thoughts. So, um, (laughs) no, I, so I'm someone who loves like young adult and that's really where I spend my time reading. Um, so a lot of the like mental health representation that I've seen has been in young adult. Like, so I, I would say like, The first book I ever read where I was like, wow, I feel really like seen and heard was The Perks of Being a Wallflower, which I know came out like in 1999, I think. And that was kind of like the first of its time and like talking about mental health, because even in the book, it's like still a bit nuanced. But there were like there were topics, you know, that just had not been discussed before. And I felt like it was so important to talk about mental health, especially with that age group. And also in middle grade as well, but like, especially with young adult, because, you know, like 13 to 18, like, that's when I, I remember that's when I realized, like, I, I was dealing with like mental health struggles. And that's really when you're kind of like finding who you are and like forming your own opinions and everything outside of like, you know, what you were taught as a kid and stuff. So I think that was like the first book. And then I feel like there are some books who have done a great job of portraying like mental health like I would say like some great examples and these aren't necessarily like new books but like these are some of my favorites and like some that I think do a really good job of accurately portraying like different you know mental health struggles 
I would say um, Turtles All the Way Down by John Green. That is one of the like best books I've ever read and like most accurate as far as um, mental health representation. I feel like I actually discovered that I have OCD from reading that book. Um, and then I met like, and then I met with like a professional and I was diagnosed with it. But like that book literally, like it was so accurate that I was like, oh my God, this is exactly what I'm dealing with. And it was able to kind of sh- lead me and like change my life. Um, so I would like highly recommend reading that book to anyone if they want to learn learn more about OCD or just like, it has a good plot as well, but the representation is just so accurate. Um, and then another one is Words on Bathroom Walls. I don't know if that one's as popular. It actually was a movie as well, and the movie was pretty good. Um, it talks about um, a teenager in high school who deals with schizophrenia and the portrayal of it, I really liked because even though he had like treatment resistant, um, schizophrenia, um, it still talked about kind of like the joys in his life. So like he loved cooking. Um, and it was just like, it was kind of funny cause it, it talked about like, you know, his everyday like struggles, his everyday, like things that he dealt with as a teenager outside of like just his mental illness that he dealt with. And the main character, his name's Adam, he was so just, like, sarcastic and funny. Um, And I think it's really important, like, if you're going to write, like, a, I don't want to say, like, very serious book, but if you're going to write, like, a contemporary or, like, young adult book or, like, a literary fiction book involving, like, mental health as, like, one of the main themes, it's also important to make it not so triggering that people that have those things like aren't even able to read it. So I think that's like a really big thing that I kind of like try to advocate for because there are things that like I I I want to be like a mental health advocate and I think I am and I want to take on people who have health, mental health representation and their stories but if it's done in a way that's like very triggering to individuals who deal with mental health struggles. Like it, it's not really doing like what it came for, like for lack of a better term, I guess. I don't know. Like this is a very probably unpopular opinion um, and no offense to Matt. I think it's Matt, Matt, Matt Haig, Matt Haig. He's a really good writer. And I thought the, the idea for the midnight, midnight library was like a very, very unique idea. I loved like the idea that, someone could, you know, live different lives and through this like library and stuff. But I I shouldn't, I guess I shouldn't like spoil the ending in case people (laughs) have it. But essentially, I don't think that mental health representation really did it for me. And so I was kind of disappointed because I was like, oh, like, this is, um, this is a book I'm really looking forward to reading because like everyone was like, oh, mental health representation. But I don't really think it did it. Essentially, I don't love books that kind of say like, oh, I figured this one part of my life out. Now I don't have to deal with my mental illness or like now my depression is gone. Like that's just not how it works and like not how life is. So I don't I don't really like when books kind of kind of go towards that um, that spectrum, I guess. Yeah, no, a lot of really great points. And I think the biggest thing is, like you said, like accurate portrayal in a way it's not too triggering and something for me I don't know if you agree on this point or not but I just don't like when mental health or bullying or something like that is used solely as a plot device where it feels like it's just to serve the story and it's not authentic to the character and there's not like a solid motivation for bullying to be going on or there's not like a depth to the situation for the characters depression or anxiety if it's used as a plot device that kind of isn't really good for me as a reader just because it's it feels more like it's being used to achieve something while it's not telling that character's authentic story so that's something that I wanted to add yeah I definitely agree like I think it needs to be something that's kind of like embedded in the character from the beginning like people can definitely do it in like a more nuanced way if they're not wanting it to be like, oh my gosh, the entire point of the story is about mental health. But I mean, and this is like different than mental health. This is chronic illness. But like with Fourth Wing, like 
how Rebecca Yaros, you know, incorporated like the Ehlers Danro syndrome for Violet, like throughout the entire story, but it, it wasn't like a plot device. It was like, it was actually kind of a strength. Um, so things like that, I feel like are, and it takes a lot of skill to do that, but you know, I think it's important. Yeah. And the other thing too, is that, um, and I think this goes for any kind of representation, like a mental illness or disability. It's also just important for me specifically. And I don't know if you agree too, that that's not the character's only label like there's more to them they are not their mental illness they're not their disability they are their own person and they have good parts about themselves and you know they have different parts of their lives and so I think to also stay away from instances of making somebody's situation their full identity because I don't think that's really authentic yeah I definitely agree like I feel like sometimes it can feel like all-consuming but it's like that's not the only thing that's going on in the person's life or that's not all there is to someone's character, um, whether it's real life or a story. So, again, like I think that really ties back to like accurate representation. So for someone who wants to incorporate mental health into their stories, if they aren't writing from a real life experience, what advice do you have for them? Um, (laughs) I think, I think, sorry, it's just like, I'm thinking about how, like, every single story that I write, like, has some kind of mental health representation, but it's because, like, I have kind of dealt with it, like, for more than half my life, um, and I think, I think that's coming from a really, like, pure, pure, I don't know if that's the right word to say, place if someone is wanting to, like, write a character that, deals with mental health struggles, but yet they might not themselves. I think it's really important to have like sensitivity readers, um, making sure, you know, again, that the content that they're writing is not like too triggering. Um, Probably talking to individuals that have like the specific mental health struggle that the individual is writing about, or if it's like more than one talking to individual, like just whatever it is, an individual that has it. And doing research, because I feel like as writers, like, even if we write in um, genres that aren't, like, super, you know, uh, I don't know, like, they don't require a lot of research. Like, we're not doing, like, you know, narrative nonfiction here. Like, it, it still requires, like, a little bit of research, I feel like, when you're writing, even when it's, like, fantasy or, um, you know, contemporary, whatever, like, you might have to research, like, just one or two things. So like doing research, like looking at articles, um, there are a lot of good resources for like mental health. There's like the national Alliance on mental illness. Um, that's like one of the ones that I really follow. Um, there's like national institutes of health. Um, they do a lot of like hardcore mental health statistics and things like that. Um, so like, as far as like the research aspect, like I feel like I would like recommend doing that, but then having like sensitivity readers and um, just like talking to people who actually deal with um, whatever they're writing about and approaching people could be like a bit difficult. Like hopefully they would approach like people they already know, because if it's someone they don't know, it might be a little bit of like an odd conversation. But I think nowadays, like it's like, I think it's less than one in four. I think it's like, I feel like it's like either one in three or something people deal with mental illness. Um, And probably after the pandemic, it's like, it's probably really one in two because a lot of people don't, don't share and don't talk about it just because it's still kind of taboo, but yeah. Yeah. Well, a lot of great advice again. And the one thing that I will just tap on at the end is that, Everyone is their own person and they're all unique. And so I think it's also important to stay away from 100% stereotypes because that can also come off wrong. Oh, yeah, definitely. Um, Yeah, it's uh, sorry. I'm like, I don't want to make it about me. But as someone who (laughs) has as someone who has like OCD, like it's the it's the portrayal and the media of it is very inaccurate. And like, there's a lot of like stereotypes around it. Um, And it makes me like really angry sometimes because people are like, oh, you just like your shoes in a certain way. And I'm like, no, it's actually like can be very debilitating sometimes. So I totally agree. (laughs) (laughs) 
Fabulous. Well, this has been a wonderful chat. And just to wrap up, what are some final thoughts you have on mental health and publishing? Um, I would just say, like, everyone, now is, like, the time to be supportive of each other. And just remember, again, that we're all human beings. Like, we're all just, like, trying to do our jobs or, like, whatever we're passionate about. Um, So just remembering that. And then also, like, if you're wanting to include mental health representation in your stories, like, make sure you're, you're doing your best to do it in a way that would, um, you know, pe- what people would resonate, it would resonate, sorry, with people that deal with the same mental health struggles. Fabulous. Well, Caroline, it was a joy having you on the show for this fantastic conversation. And this brings us to the plot twist, where I get to ask you a fun question you could have never seen coming. Are you ready? Yay. Yes, I think <laughs> I'm ready. We'll see what it is. <laughs> so this is going to be fun. So imagine that you are getting the opportunity to open your own library. What would you call it and how would you decorate it? Oh my gosh, that's like a dream come true. Um, okay, <laughs> I, I gotta think about it. Like, I always want to like incorporate because I, okay, so I have like, my nickname is Care, like C-A-R-E. Um, and then like I, for a lot of my like usernames, I'll do like true, like TRU. So it's like, I always like play on like true and like care. So I'm like, let me think. I feel like it would be something like true. I don't know. (laughs) This is tough. Uh, okay. Let's see. True. Well, how I would decorate it. I'll start with how I would decorate it because I'm like having struggling with the name for some reason. (laughs) Um, I feel like I would make it like almost like, oh my gosh, if I could do like whatever I wanted, like I would have the library open like super late um, so that people could come. Because sometimes the library, at least here, like in Jacksonville, Florida, I know like people work there. So like they have to have, you know, work-life balance. Um, But sometimes it closes at like 6 p.m. And it's so depressing because I want to go and like sit and write at the library, but then it closes really early. Um, so I would have it like open to like 10, 11 PM if I could. And I would have like fuzzy bucket chairs. Like it's kind of hard to explain, but I have like a bucket chair in my loft that I'm in right now and it's like super fuzzy and really comfortable. So I'd have like those, I would have like beanbag chairs. People could like lay back in and like read. And I would kind of want to keep like some of the traditional stuff. Like I really... I know the chairs at libraries are uncomfortable for the most part. Like the the wooden chairs with like the tiny like padded back that's like not even really padded. Um, but I would want to keep like probably like some parts of it like traditional looking. But I also would love to have like little like fairy lights like along just like, I don't know, along the perimeter, like along everywhere. Um, and then kind of like almost it would be really cool too to like somehow the ceiling could like look like a galaxy like I don't know how oh, it's cool that, but yeah I'm really into like space like I actually wanted to be an astronaut when I was younger but, like, but I'm not smart enough so. um okay so back to the name I guess and I probably would do like war- warm tone like I don't know I would do like gray gray brown and then mix with like pink like those are kind of like I tend to do like nude tones like when I'm decorating stuff. So I like to do like that. And then also maybe sage green because that's like one of my favorite colors. But okay, name of the library, like truly yours library. I don't I don't know some something like that or um, something about caring like we care about no I don't know I'll 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 stick with like true truly yours I guess oh that's cute because I'm like I don't know I'm like I should be more creative than this I guess but I can't think of anything else well it sounds like a very comfy library I would want to go to that one yeah I would want it to be like a place where people could come and like hang out like you know if they're not like if they don't have stuff to do on like a Friday night or whatever like come to the library because I'm like I'm at I mean I'm only 28 but I'm like at an age now where I'm like I would rather go like spend time at the library than like go out <laughs> like that so before we go I would love for you to share with everyone where they can find you online and check out your manuscript wish list if they are interested in querying you of course so I'm mostly on Twitter and my 
I don't know why I always have trouble remembering my thing, so I'm looking it up right now. I am at Caroline J T R U Lit as in literary L I T on Twitter slash X. I don't know what it's even called now. Um, and then if you'd like to find me on TikTok, I post a lot about writing on there and just like some fun funny stuff about my cat as well. And I am also Caroline J True Lit on there. Um, those are the two main, I would say social media sites that I use. Um, and then as far as my manuscript wish list, it's both on the actual like official manuscript wish list website. If you search my name, Caroline Trussell, and then, um, the metamorphosis literary website, which is metamorphosis literary agency.com kind of long, but just meta, just the name metamorphosis literary agency.com and you click on submissions and you'll see my wish list there fabulous thank you so much for joining me of course thank you so much for having me yeah absolutely and listeners that is a wrap on this chapter of literary blend with caroline all about mental health and publishing if you enjoyed our conversation please consider leaving the podcast five stars and giving it a review to help others just like you discover it also if you have friends in publishing who you think would enjoy the show please pass it along to them thank you for listening and until we flip to the next chapter happy reading and writing